Okay, guys, the name of this message is going to be called Hiss. Hiss. H-I-S-S. Hiss. We know that different animals have little sayings. We say that the cow says moo. That makes sense. You hear him go moo, right? And then they say the pig says oink. Makes sense. Oink, 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 right? Then they say the horse says nay, which I don't understand because it sounds to me like the horses go, you know, that doesn't really sound like nay to me, but you know, whatever. Okay, I, I got it. <laughs> we, we got the point. But snakes usually make a hissing sound. They go, right? Like all they can do is just say S words, just that's what they do is they hiss. And I just want you to know that the devil is very much snake-like. He just wants to, to get up in your ear and get into your mind and just hiss a lot. Because that same hissing noise is, is similar to what people do when they want to come and whisper something in your ear that, that they really shouldn't be saying, whether it be... Uh, gossiping or whether it be getting in your ear to to uh, to just say negative things that they shouldn't come whisper to you about uh, uh, negative things to you that they want to say but they don't want others to hear because they don't want other people to know that they would say such a mean or terrible or hurtful thing to you but usually when somebody comes up and says some things that uh, probably are going to have a negative effect on your life or somebody else's. A lot of times they come up and they're like, Psst, come here, let me put a bug in your ear. Psst. They make that same hissing sound <laughs> that the snake makes. And so does the enemy. And so this message is about how the devil or the enemy, the great adversary, always wants to get up in our ears and hiss and say some things that he shouldn't, trying to plant negative seeds in our minds to destroy good seeds, to come and steal the good seed from our hearts. And a lot of times what he wants to do is either he wants to put some negativity in you, but a lot of times what he wants to do as well is he wants you to be upset with God. And so he wants you to think negative, evil thoughts towards God. He wants you to think things like, what type of a dad are you? You know, what type of a father is going to let their child go through what you're going through? He's not a good father to you. He wants you to, to think all these things. He wants you to question all the great things that God's told you. He wants you to uh, 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 think twice about the promises that God has made you. Uh, he wants you to uh, take a double take on the things, the great things that have been prophesied over you. He just wants you to, to be full of doubt, to be full of doubt, to be full of fear, to be full of disagreement with the Lord. He just wants you to have a, listen, a mind war with God. And this is something that I can relate to. And man, it just seems like the enemy is always trying to just get you to just have that doubt at, at the, 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 the times that you need to hold on to the Lord and hold on to his word and hold on to his promises the most. He just wants you to get off track the best that he can get you off course in hopes that you don't run your race, in hopes that you don't get to your breakthrough, in hopes that you don't get a blessing that God's trying to bless you with, in hopes that you, you, you take a detour when you're almost to a door that God is about to open. And so that's what he's big on. And, and, and if that doesn't work, he just wants you to feel bad about your own self. He wants you to hate yourself. And he wants you to think that you're too ugly, uh, too overweight, too short, too old, too black, too white, too this, too that. He just wants you to think the worst of yourself.
Either that or he wants you to be all puffed up. Like I said, he wants you to be uh, puffed up and, 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 and rebelling against God and saying, God, what do you know? I know how to deal with this on my own. I don't need your help. What type of dad are you? So that's, that's the type of stuff that the enemy does. He always wants to drop a thought in your head. And we know it's important to uh, cast down imaginations. You just can't let the enemy sink his claws or listen his fangs into you and get all up in your ear and start hissing you know a lot of times people come when they whisper to you they want to say let me put a bug in your ear well some people might be putting a bug in your ear and some people might be letting a little birdie speak to them some expressions that people use but you got to be careful because sometimes they're not being a bird they're not being a bee they're being a snake, and so they're coming to hiss and put the report of the enemy in your ear. When they should be speaking good, positive reports of the Lord, reports of angels, not the reports of the enemy, which is something you should not believe or cleave to. And so let's just uh, start with a quick opening verse, and then we're going to get into... Uh, just a few quick stories here in the Word. But just starting out here in uh, James chapter 4, just reading verse 7 real quick, it says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's important to resist the enemy. Believing what God says over the report of the enemy, even when it seems like what the enemy has to say is true. Because you got to remember, our goal is to walk by faith, not by sight. Sometimes it seems one way when really God has something going on behind the scenes. Something that he's getting ready to uh, almost surprise you with. But you wouldn't know it when you're too busy focused on the negative. You have to resist that. You cannot focus on that. You've got to pretty much turn a blind eye to that, to what it is that the enemy has to say or what it is that he's trying to present to you. You have to resist it. Don't let yourself get wound up. Don't let yourself get butthurt. Don't let it let yourself get frustrated because that's what he wants to do. He wants to get you distracted in this time. Do not give in. Don't give in to his tricks, to his temptations, to his traps, to his wiles. Continue to submit to God. Continue to go with what God says. Resist the enemy. Keep him behind you. Keep him under your feet. And there has to come a point where he will flee. Now, of course, he'll want to come back and start trouble with you again. But at least for some time, he will flee. And you can get rest. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. We'll start here at the beginning. It says this, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Let me pause right here. We know what happened, you know, when God had created Adam and Eve and uh, he had these two in the garden. One of the rules, really the only rule, really, was for them to not eat of this one particular tree. And the enemy, Satan, coming in the form of that serpent, <laughs> coming in hissing, uh, got Eve's attention and was wanting her to rebel and to just do whatever she wanted. And Eve began explaining, no, 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 this is what God had to say. We cannot eat of this tree. The same tree that you're telling us to go ahead and eat of, he's saying, 
not to. He has made it clear not to do this. He's made it clear of the consequences of what will happen if we partake of this tree. And so let me say this. There are some different tactics, tactics of how to deal with the enemy. One, like I said earlier, will be to just ignore him, to turn a blind eye, don't even look his way, don't even focus. But a couple other ways is, of course, rebuking the enemy, telling him to flee, telling him that you will not tolerate his presence or his nonsense. And another thing is to quote scripture. In other words, say what it is that God has to say. So when he says one thing contrary to what God has told you, you say, no, this is what God has to say, and I'm following what God has to say. So what Eve did here was a, was a good thing. She was like, no, this is what God has to say. But she didn't stand her ground. She didn't continue to stand her ground, rather. And that's where she messed up. She was on the right track. She quoted God and said, no, this is what God has to say. But she didn't continue to stand. So it says this, and the, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, in other words, she quit going by faith in what God said. She started to go by sight. Well, now that I think of it, that tree does look pretty good. Mm. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So a lot of times people want to point the finger at Eve, the woman for the fall of man. But, but Adam was just as responsible because he didn't have to eat of it either. So really they're both to blame. And well, it was the serpent that tempted them. So he was also in a way to blame. I never understood why we would pick one to blame when all of them had something to do with it and it makes sense to look at it that way because if you continue to read further you see that God does give all three of them punishments I just wanted to throw that out there but anyway I'm just I'm going to get back to the subject at hand just wanted to throw that out there but it says the eyes of them were both open and they were naked and they covered themselves with leaves and also, later, we, we read that they are ashamed. They're ashamed of themselves now because now they see that they're naked when prior to the sin, they didn't see it. That's what happens many times when we give in to the hissing. We listen to what the enemy says and we act or react in some kind of way and we end up doing something that when we finally realize what we've done, we end up feeling embarrassed. We end up feeling ashamed. We end up reflecting on what we've done and saying, why in the world did I do that? I knew better. I shouldn't have been angry and lashed out at God just because the enemy got me wound up and got me in my emotions and got me walking by sight. I shouldn't have acted a certain way and did certain things just because I was mad or butthurt or just wanted to be rebellious. Now I look back and I think, man, why did I do that? I was so foolish. I made a fool out of myself. I looked stupid. And at the end of the day, it really didn't accomplish me anything. It really caused me more hurt or more trouble than it did benefit me. Something to consider. With that said, let's see here. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Starting here at the beginning, it says this. When Jesus, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 
We and when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made of bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So what we see going on here is this. Satan comes to mess with Jesus to pick at him, to tempt him, to do things that he ought not. Jesus had a huge moment. He was baptized. And that's when the enemy wants to come in to start trouble, either right before or right after a really huge breakthrough for you, something big. And here he comes to screw it all up. Sometimes he wants to screw it up for you, but also he wants to screw things up for onlookers. See, when God does things for you, begins to do big things for you, or he's about to do something big, a lot of times he wants to stop you. The enemy wants to stop you, but also he's also looking at the people who are watching you, whether openly, blatantly watching you or people who secretly watch you from the sidelines or from the shadows. He doesn't want even others these onlookers to be inspired by you, to be inspired by what God does for you because he doesn't want them to think, oh, well, maybe God could do that for me. So he wants to ruin things for you. And he also wants to ruin things for your witness, for your testimony, so that others don't get excited about God as well. So he wants to come in and mess things up at a time where, where it just seems like God is really showing up showing out moving in your life and others are able to see it and so like I said that huge moment of him being baptized and right away uh, here comes the enemy and he's tempting him saying do this do that tries to get Jesus to prove himself to him doing all this crazy stuff and every time the enemy comes and tries to hiss something into Jesus's ear. If you notice, Jesus keeps responding with uh, basically with scripture, with the word. Verse four, it said, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So he's giving him scripture. He's saying what it is that God has to say about the situation. Then in verse seven, after uh, the enemy says more stuff than Jesus, he says, it says this, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so then the devil tries one final third time to, to get in Jesus' ear and start hissing about some stuff. And then in verse 10 it says, then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall thy serve. He's saying, I'm not here to serve you. I don't have to prove myself to you. And I'm not here to go by sight. I'm not here to be tempted with all these offers you're trying to give me, taking me higher, because I know who I am. And I know all oh, this is really mine anyway. It's not yours to give away to me or anybody else. You ain't nothing. You're just the enemy. You're beneath my feet. And so I say unto you, I don't serve you. I serve the Father that is in heaven. So he is continuously combating him with the word, combating him with what God has to say and rebuking him. So then finally in verse 11, it says this, 
Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. In other words, the devil had to flee because Jesus continually resisted him and submitted himself unto God the Father. Going back to the first verse I read in James, you have to submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee. At some point, he'll just be like, man, I came here to wear him or her out and I'm wore out because this, this ain't working. <laughs> this plan I got ain't really working. So I'm the one that's getting wore out. Time for me to go. <laughs> With that said, let's move on to First Kings. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 9, starting here at the beginning, it says this. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and wilt keep my statutes and my judgments, then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. So God is saying some great things to Solomon. We know who Solomon was, the son of David. David, he already had it going on, right? We know that David was the one who had a heart after God's own heart, and God uh, raised him up from nothing to something, raised him up from the little shepherd boy he was to king of Israel. People loved them some David. And so Solomon also have, had a heart after God. So he, he really had two advantages. He had the heart after God, but then to top it off, you know, he's a descendant of David. So it's like he are, he's already going to have some favor anyway because of that. You know what I mean? So, I mean, he, he, he had it, man. He had it going for him. And what Solomon is known for, he's known for a couple of things. He's known for his riches, how rich, how wealthy God made him, simply because that's not what he asked for. You know, God came to him in a dream and asked what he wanted. And, and he didn't ask for riches. He asked for wisdom so that he would know how to lead God's people the best way as possible because he was humbled by the fact that God was going to use him. So he said, God, just give me the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding to lead your people correctly and in the right direction. And God was so impressed that that's what he asked for. And he even said, you know, a lot of people in your position would have asked to be rich. A lot of people in your position would have asked for the heads of their enemies. They would have asked for all kinds of things other than wisdom to help my people out. But since that's what you asked for is the wisdom, not only am I going to give you great wisdom, I'm also going to make you rich too. I'm going to give you things that you didn't even ask for because you didn't ask for it, because you did something different, because you stepped outside of the box, because your heart was in the right place. I'm going to give you way more than what you asked for, than what you imagined. Eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. Come on. He's like, I'm going to give you uh, above and beyond. You, you ain't going to have room enough to contain it all, to receive it all. It's going to be so good. So he had it going for him. He had the wealth. He had the wisdom. People traveled to see Solomon to, to, to get wisdom, to get uh, his, his, uh, his thoughts and ideas on things. They wanted to know his opinions about stuff. People were amazed and mind blown by him. And we see God here saying, hey, you know, I've got your back. I'm going to bless you. Israel's going to be blessed because of you. I mean, this is, this is going to be great. But let's look at what it says here in verse 6. It says, but if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, 
which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them and this house, which I have hallowed for my name, will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house which is high, every one that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss. And they shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? And they shall answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God and brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have taken hold upon other gods and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. So what's being said here is this. God saying, listen, Solomon, you got it made. I, I got you. I got your back and all this. This is going to be great. All you got to do is just keep obeying me, keep submitting to me, keep following me. I'm going to make this worth your while. However, I, I, I'm blessing Israel through you. But, but, but as soon as you start to turn away from me, and start to turn to other gods and start worshiping other beings besides me, the one who got you to this point and who's going to take you further. When you turn your back away from me and serve other gods and do things other people's way, then I'll have to turn from helping you and all Israel will be cut off. The more you let me bless you, the more I can bless all Israel. But the more you walk away from me and you start to cut yourself off from me, I got to cut myself off from supplying Israel. You've got to stay focused upon me. And the Lord even uh, explained in some other scripture, hey, Listen, you guys, all of you, all of you in Israel, I don't want you going after strange wives. And he didn't mean strange like weird or, you know, different. He meant strangers in, uh, listen, women from other lands that worshipped other gods. He's saying don't go after these women because if you do and you fall in love with them and you get all in your emotions and your feelings and your flesh with these women, they're going to get you to turn away from me and start worshipping their gods, these false gods, these little G gods. And so when you do that, you're, you're causing your own destruction because I cannot continue to bless you and help you and lead you and guide you when you're trying to worship and serve and follow and listen to these false gods, these other gods. I am the only one true God. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You cannot go after these other gods. So they were warned, Solomon was warned, you know, don't don't start going after these other gods and don't start going after these women that are going to lead you into worshiping these other gods. Just don't do it. It's not going to be good for any of you guys. But I, 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 the thing that stood out to me was verses 8 and 9, especially 8, where he's talking about <laughs> When when they begin to disobey and all this destruction comes out of them worshiping the false gods, people were going to stop by and look and hiss. And it means hiss from the perspective of just naysaying, just, you know, when people come and shake their head or wag their finger at you or at something that they see that they disapprove of and they're just like, mm -mm -mm. that, that's what it means, a hissing. That's what will happen. You'll be hissed at by the people. And, and it will be said that the reason why this calamity, this destruction has happened is because the people forsook their God that got them out of the bondages of Egypt and took them into a promised land and who gave them all these great things. In other words, it'll be known why this happened and people will just you know, shake their heads and just speak negatively of you and just hiss, hiss, hiss. So I'm, I'm bringing all this up to say this. 
you've really got two different types of hissing. See, when the enemy comes in, when the devil comes in and he starts hissing, so to speak, and starts putting all these thoughts into your head, when you don't cast them down and you let them play out in your head and they really start working on you and you and these thoughts and start getting you all worked up and you want to react and act on all these negative things that the enemy has to say and all this hissing, you set yourself up for destruction, just like how these strange women would set them up for destruction by talking into talking the God's people into worshiping these false gods. Well, when you when you give in to the hissing of the enemy and you have destruction that falls upon you, you set yourself up to be hissed by people. And you may say, well, why should we care about the opinions of people? I'm not saying you should care about the opinions of people. But what I'm saying is you're setting your, yourself up for two different types of negativity. See, it's kind of like this. When you look at it, you have negativity and you got positivity. And they're like two opposites. But then you got these things called polar opposites or as some would say, when something is two sides of the same coin. See, what I'm talking about is a negativity and positivity. I'm talking about negativity and false positivity. They may seem like opposites, but they actually kind of work together. They're two different sides, but of the same coin. Even though they seem different, they really are together and work together. The enemy wants to give you false positivity. Like when he went up to Eve and was like, no, go ahead and eat that apple, girl. You go, girl. <laughs> right? Encouraging her to do what she shouldn't be doing. Get it? False positivity. Wrong uh, or, or false positivity. Wrong positivity. Not true positivity. It's not true uh, really encouraging somebody. But giving them so-called good words to set them up for a fall. Setting them up to fall the way he fell from heaven. Right? That's why when Adam and Eve sinned, we call it the fall of man. Get it? He's just trying to get you to fall the way he fell. That's it. He don't care nothing about you. So we get that false positivity in us, that false encouragement, which gets us all puffed up to fall and then when that fall happens here comes people trash talking and wagging their finger and wagging their head and going mm -mm -mm. and here you go listening to them having to to hiss at you so the enemy was hissing at you and it, and it puffed you up it kind of felt good until destruction came and then when the people come and hiss which is the negativity because like I said you had the, the false positivity, now you got the negativity from the people of them hissing at you. And then that tears you down a different way because that can hurt you. If, you. if you're the type of person that words hurt, those words will come to hurt you, to penetrate you, and, and to tear you down emotionally. So you were torn down one way with the false positivity. And then with the hissing of the people, you get that negativity, which just tears you down even more. So that's basically what God is saying. Don't give in to the hissing or the false positivity of the enemy because when destruction comes, and it will, when you give in to that hissing, then you'll have to deal with the hissing of the people, the, negative, the negativity and the naysaying of the people that's just going to bring you down even more. Hiss, hiss, hiss. That's all it is. Listen, Jesus, the, the, the devil came after Jesus with hissing. He, he came after Adam and Eve with the hissing. And if Solomon was to give in to the hissing, which he ended up doing, he would have to deal with the hissing of the people. Same thing, different day. Same thing, different person. But it's all the same. It's all the same. Nothing new under the sun. Everything that's, that we see going on has already been done before. It's just the same tactic of the enemy over and over, but presented a little bit differently, presented in a different package to seem different. 
but it's all hissing. It's all a bunch of nonsense. It's all a bunch of garbage that's only put in place to make you feel puffed up, but then it, it's just going to tear you down. And then you got the hissing of the people that's going to tear you down. It's all to bring you down and cause destruction and calamity. Sin's only fun for a season, but then there goes that fall, there goes that destruction. Do not give in to the hissing of the enemy, because all that's going to do is lead you to the hissing of people. You're going to go from, from just the, the devil hissing at you to, to many people hissing at you. It's one thing to rebuke the devil and watch him flee, but sometimes it's hard to get people to leave you alone. Some folks just don't care about scripture or what scripture says. You can say stuff about the Bible all day long and they still will not stop hissing at you. Think about that. You give in to that hissing, you deal with the hissing of the people and sometimes it's hard to get away from. Don't believe me? Think about the people that won't let you live your past down. People who bring up your past. You see what I'm saying now? You give in to this hissing over here. Now you're going to have to live with this hissing from the people. And they're, gonna, they, they're not going to let you live it down. They're going to keep bringing up your past. Hiss, hiss, hiss. The more you give in to this hissing in the ear, the more you're going to have to deal with this hissing over here from the people. Do not give in to the first hissing in the first place. And so now I'll take you to the very last spot I want to go to. And I'll wrap this up. It's in Joshua chapter 24 starting at the beginning. It says this. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they presented themselves before God and Joshua said unto all the people thus saith the Lord God of Israel your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time even Terah the father of Abraham and the father of Nachor and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac and gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau and gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. And sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out, and I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and ye came unto the sea. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side, Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. So these people are being reminded right now of all that God has done for them, what God has taken them from and brought them to. He's, they're being reminded of how God did all of what he did to get those people out of slavery from the Egyptians and how he overtook their chariots. And then he's reminded them of coming up against the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan and how he helped them overcome those guys so that they could get to their promised land. And look at this verse 9. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hands. Some of you that have been listening to me for a while, you remember that. You remember not too long ago I did that sermon on Balak and Balaam. 
how Balak had sent after Balaam to come and curse the people so that God's people would not progress. He wanted to keep them sitting still. And instead, uh, he ended up accidentally blessing them instead of cursing them. But it was all because of God's hand. And so God is reminding them of even that. Verse 11. And ye went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. The Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. God saying, look, I, I, I've defended you against all these groups of people just bombarding you, trying to tag team you like this is wrestling. But, but I helped you out. I was your tag team partner. You didn't need a whole bunch of other folks, uh, a bunch of other tribes to come help you. I had your back. I was all that you needed. And when you tagged my hand to come in, I gave them into your hand. <laughs> Verse 12. Uh, I like how I put that together there. That's, that's kind of cool. Verse 12. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you. Even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with the sword, nor with the bow. Kings couldn't even stop you because I had your back. Verse 13, and I gave, or sorry, and I have given you a land for which ye did not labor. He's saying, I'm giving you stuff you didn't even work for. Moving on, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not. So you didn't work for any of this, this land, didn't build this city, didn't plant these vineyards, but I'm giving them to you. Verse 14, now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. So what's being said here is this. Look at all that God's done for you and look at what he's doing for you now. You didn't earn this. You don't deserve it. But God has done it for you. Why won't, why won't you fear and serve and reverence him? Why do you still have moments of going back to serving these false gods? So what if they were the so-called gods of your fathers or forefathers? So what? You're more caught up in traditions and pleasing people than pleasing God, and you can't do both. They're going to clash at some point. You've got to serve the God that has gotten you from point A to point B. Verse 15, and if it seem evil unto you, here it is, last verse, listen to this. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. He's saying, pick now. If it's such a bad thing to serve our God, okay, then, then pick now. Don't ride the fence. Don't be wishy-washy. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Mean what you say. Either you're going to be on that side of the fence or this side of the fence. Or kind of like how he put it on one side of the flood or the other. You know what I mean? Are you going to serve the gods that had you over there? The side that got flooded out, are you going to serve the one true God that kept you from the flood? That's what he's saying. In other words, he's sounding a little bit like Elijah when he was telling those folks, okay, how long will you guys be caught between two opinions? Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve Baal? Are you going to serve God or are you going to bow down to Jezebel? Are you going to eat at the Lord's table or are you going to eat at the prophets of Jezebel's table? Are you going to go with God or are you going to uh, cower down to Balak and Balaam because you're scared they might say something, might have something negative to say? In other words, you're scared they're going to hiss at you. Come on. You're scared they're going to hiss, hiss, and put a curse, curse on you when you should know that your God's got your back if you're fully serving him and not going after other gods or trying to make idols out of other people that you put before God. 
right? But finally, the end of this verse, the end of verse 15, look at what it says. If you're wondering what to say, if you're having issues now with the enemy hissing at you, trying to put thoughts into you, people trying to hiss at you, trying to make you feel a certain way because you choose to stand your ground and believe God over the report of the enemy, this is a great thing to stand up and declare in the enemy's face right now. The end of verse 15, we know this, is quoted all the time. It says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can do what you want to do. So what if we're friends? So what if we're associates? So what if we're co-workers? So what if we go back? So what if we knew each other back in the day? Or so what if we've become good friends recently? So what if we're even family? So what? Just because you're going to go after other gods or just because you're going to make idols out of people and get on your knees and kiss butt cheek, that's your business, but that doesn't mean I have to participate in it as well. You do what you want to do. You make your decision on who you're going to choose to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Not maybe serve the Lord. Not I'll think about it. Not today we'll do this and tomorrow we'll serve that God. Uh, not be wishy-washy. Not, uh, well, it depends on who we're hanging out with. Come on. Because you got some Christians, they, they believe in God and believe Jesus is only uh, is the only way until they get around certain folks. And then all of a sudden, well, you know, maybe it's just between you and the Lord. Maybe there is another way to heaven. Eh, wrong. It doesn't matter who you're around. It doesn't matter if you think somebody's cute and you want to impress them and you want somebody to like you. No matter who's around, you've got to have it made up in your mind that you will serve the Lord. That's what you say to the enemy's hissing. I will serve the Lord. No matter how many times you get me to doubt God, to turn my back on God. I'd rather turn my back on you and put you under my feet because I am the head and not the tail. I will serve the Lord. My God. Capital G. Hiss on that. I'll pray us out of here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for another time to minister another word. And Lord, I just pray that those who need this message would tune in and hear it. Lord, we need to be reminded sometimes that we must choose your report over the enemy's report. I don't care how smart they are, or how smart they seem, or what their degrees are in. At the end of the day, the only thermometer... <laughs> That, that matters right now is the thermometer talking about how hot it is because it is hot outside. <laughs> but it don't matter in other degrees what your doctrine is in, what your doctrine is in. All that matters is that you know that what God says goes. Not what the enemy says not the hissing of the devil, not the hissing of the people, not the negativity or the false positivity, because we don't need anybody saying a bunch of bull crap just to get us pumped up and feel, feeling good, but to set us up for a fall. That's the same type of stuff that went on with Goliath. He was all pumped up and was talking trash and had the biggest fall, probably one of the biggest falls in the Bible other than Satan because that was a huge fall. He fell like lightning. Talk about a hard fall. But other than that, <laughs> Goliath had a pretty hard fall. And that's what happens when you get puffed up with false positivity. And so, Lord, let the people be reminded of that and that you are the only way. That no matter who we're around, it don't matter if we're hanging out with, with friends somewhere, if we're at a family reunion, if we're at work, if we're in town or out of town, it don't matter where we're at. At all times, 
we must believe on you and be willing to openly say that the one true God of our Bibles is the only God that me and my house will serve. Even when others don't, the one true God who still remains, who will always remain, who is everlasting, he's the one that I will serve forever and ever because he's the only one who exists forever and ever, always was and always will be. God, I thank you. And I just give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name do I pray. Amen.